For the first time in a British colony, Africans were given control of an entire cabinet. There were no British ministers. And Krumah's hopes for a trouble-free transition to independence were soon destroyed by the leaders of Ashanti. The Ashantis had been among the greatest warriors in Africa and once ruled an empire as large as the Gold Coast itself. They were fiercely loyal to the Asantahini, the ruler of their kingdom, and to their ancient system of government. Ashanti was the wealthiest region in the colony, rich in cocoa and gold. Within weeks of the election, the Ashanti chiefs and cocoa farmers launched the National Liberation Movement to battle for a federal system of government to protect the power, the wealth, and the traditions of their region from the central government in Accra. It was led by a senior minister in the Asantahini's court, Bafor Akoto. The very day we are inaugurating uh, uh, NLM, they started stone throwing. They even sent people on the way. When the people are coming to a rally, they told them that the rally didn't go on, so they must return. And few people who came they stoned their cars. And even when they were in the ready, they stoned us with the bottles and stones. While the police were standing unconcerned. But as we were determined to deliver Ashanti and part of the country from Nkrumah, we were also determined. I've told them that you I don't want you to be a violent. But when anybody attack you, try to defend yourself. In Ashanti, both the National Liberation Movement and the CPP created strong-arm gangs called Action Groupers and Action Troopers to travel the region threatening each other's supporters. The intimidation turned to killing when the CPP's propaganda chief stabbed to death E.Y. Bafo, a National Liberation Movement leader. The political parties were now facing each other in gang warfare. Oh, God! When? After Baffo's death, we saw that, oh, I see. If the scene has become killing, then we shall also wake up and kill. Then we started vigorously with anybody. We were fighting here and there. And so we could do similar as they did. We were trying to do it too. And we also swore that if anybody dares to commit a crime on the name of our member, we shall also revenge. And then it became a hectic game. Hectic game, instead of uh, this thing, normal struggle of, for this thing, uh, uh, campaigning for each party, after it became a threatening affair. And so that was the end of the game. The action groupers of the National Liberation Movement took control of key areas. CPP supporters in the Ashanti capital, Kumasi, were forced to flee and take refuge in Accra. It became unsafe for Nkrumah and his ministers to visit Ashanti. The governor, Sir Charles Arden Clark, was thought to be a supporter of Nkrumah, and when he came to Kumasi for a routine visit, he received a rough reception. And we were driving along very slowly, and all these people were piled up on the side of the road, so we couldn't drive quickly. And then we, we heard stones hitting the car as we went by. 
and the agitators were brandishing their fists and yelling in the vernacular. I couldn't understand what they were saying, fortunately, perhaps. The Ashantis had come to the conclusion that it was Nkrumah's mouthpiece and not the mouthpiece of the British government. And that uh, anything he came to say, he had previously discussed with Nkrumah. And maybe because Nkrumah could not visit Kumasi at that time, he had come forward as governor to put across Nkrumah's views. And therefore, they decided that if Nkrumah could not come, his surrogate should not come. The Northern Territories were also in favor of a federal system of government to protect their region. This was the poorest and least developed part of the Gold Coast. It had been a British protectorate since the days of Queen Victoria. Their chiefs were strongly opposed to the idea of rapid independence and said they feared that the benevolent protection of the British would be replaced by domination by black men from the South. So um, we sent a delegation to Beijing, and I spoke for the, for the Northern Territories. And I told them that uh, when the chiefs of the Northern Territories entered into uh, what is it, treaties for protection with the British Crown, um, they understood it to mean not only protection from internal and external uh, threats, but also a responsibility on the part of the British Crown to lead the people, you know, um, to stand on their feet and be able to manage their own affairs. Now, we felt Britain had not honorably uh, played uh, her part in and, and, and that aspect. And I told them that, well, when the first British men came to our place, they told our fathers to look to them and that they were going to lead them step by step into a prosperous and happy uh, 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 country. And they believed them and felt the white man never lied. I, I used that expression, I said, they believed the white man never lied, but it appears you are going back on your word, which means you, <laughs> you are not going to lie to them to use that word. So I thought Britain had a moral obligation, you know, to um, help us out of our present difficulty. In Ashanti, the violence was getting worse. It spread to Accra and even reached the Prime Minister's house. There was a very strong smell coming up from below. And uh, I thought at the time, you know, it's a bit off to think that this is a Prime Minister's residence, all this dreadful, you can't even sort of sit and chat without this dreadful noise and the awful smells coming up. And suddenly a terrific lot of smoke came up, sort of, you know, yellowy, grey smoke with a very strong smell of, or I said, it smells like fireworks. And um, when I, as soon as I said this, uh, two of these chaps said, my God, fireworks, you know, and jumped up and went downstairs and they'd hardly got to the bottom of the steps when this terrific explosion happened. And there was a dreadful shattering of glass, you know, and all this sort of thing. But miraculously, nobody was hurt. The police told Nkrumah there was enough gelic night to destroy the building. After two years of violence, the National Liberation Movement campaign had convinced the colonial secretary, Alan Lennox Boyd, that yet another election must be held. And Krumer sent his two most trusted colleagues to resist. Now, we had gone to London to try and convince the secretary of state that it was not fair to us, having fought an election in 54, barely two years later, to have to fight a second election before independence. Uh, when we arrived, we found Lennox Boyd absolutely unyielding. And he disarmed us by saying, look, gentlemen, Mr. Bozio, Mr. Benema, if I must put the Ghana Gold Coast Independence Act before Parliament, they must be prepared to back me. I can't go and have it rejected. And their condition is that they would like to hand over to the majority party in the country. And reports they had been having were to the effect that the CPP had lost its majority. We tried to convince him that this was not true, but he would not yield. The CPP faced an opposition united behind a clear demand. 
They wanted a federal system of government to give power to the regions and prevent domination from Accra. Among the National Liberation Movement's chief campaigners was Joe Appiah, a former close associate of Nkrumah, who had defected to the opposition. He recalls what he told the voters. Basically, I told them of the corruption. I told them of the burdening tyranny that we could foresee ahead. I told them why we had struggled for independence. I told them we did not want to sack the British Raj in order to substitute a black Raj. And I explained to them that in the light of the facts as we saw them, in the light of the evidence available, these were foreboding times. In spite of a vigorous campaign by the opposition, the CPP won with a massive majority. But the National Liberation Movement were not prepared to give up. They refused to take their seats in the Legislative Assembly, refused to discuss independence, and told the Colonial Secretary, Alan Lennox Boyd, that although they'd lost the election, they'd won the argument for a federal constitution. Our argument was that we had carried overwhelmingly the northern region, we had carried overwhelmingly the Ashanti region, we had shared the honours equally with the CPP in the Transporter Trust Territory, and that the only areas where they had won decisively were the two eastern and western regions. We also pointed out at the time that whereas it took about seven to 8,000 votes to win a seat in Ashanti or the north, you only needed between two and 3,000 votes to win a seat in one of the eastern or western uh, provinces. So we were claiming then that out of the five regions, since we had effectively carried two and shared the honors with the CPP in the third, there was a strong case for a federal constitution. But the CPP had won 57% of the votes and more than two-thirds of the seats. The British government rejected the federal argument. On September the 18th, 1956, Nkrumah was empowered to announce that full independence would follow in six months. In Ashanti, this provoked a furious reaction. They talked of breaking away from the Gold Coast and renewed threats of violence and disorder. Lennox Boyd, worried by reports that the colony was on the brink of civil war, decided to see for himself. From all over the region, Ashantis travelled to Kamasi to make their strength of feeling known to him. We were greeted by a crowd of, I don't know, 10,000, many thousand Ashanti, chanting and bearing banners, some of them dressed in brown, the colour of mourning, the banners saying things like, British don't go, we don't want independence, five weeks before the declared date for independence. And uh, there was a great deal of noise and shouting and display, but uh, not, in fact, any misbehaviour, I don't think. That night, the Asantahini was able to talk to Lennox Boyd at a dinner arranged by Colin Russell. And I think Lennox Boyd was very impressed with the uh, courtesy, the genuineness, the strength of appeal of the Asantahini, who, who loved his people and really was their king. And I think Lennox Boyd wanted to do what he could to help the Ashantis. In other words, just like myself and the other administrative officers in Ashanti, we wanted to help the Ashantis. Naturally, we wanted to see independence coming, but we did want to see some safeguards for the Ashanti. Lennox Boyd flew back to Accra, convinced that some element of power for the regions must be included in the new constitution. Well, Lennox Boyd came smartly up against an immovable object, namely the governor, who was in no way disposed to see anything altered at that stage. No detail of his plan. And although I think they had some fairly amicable discussions, Arden Clark, who was a pretty persuasive fellow, I think um, managed not exactly to persuade Boyd, but to insist that his point of view was the only correct one. And if Boyd started tinkering about with the Constitution at this late stage, then there was going to be trouble and there would have to be gunboats and things like that. Lennox Boyd returned to London 
and insisted that Nkrumah's two most powerful ministers be sent to see him. He told them that regional assemblies would be included in the new constitution. That was the price of independence. At a London press conference, they appeared to have accepted this with good grace. Well, the constitution which uh, has been uh, laid before parliament is not different in any way from either the constitution of Canada, or Australia, or Ceylon. Uh, there have been a few clauses uh, put in, in to make uh, provision for our particular circumstances in the Gold Coast. If we accepted any ideas about regionalism at all, it was just a stop to get independence brought to us or given to us. Uh, but we never really intended to divide the country up uh, what they had failed to achieve to do it for them. Some of the ideas had to be washed away.